welcome to the stage, Shantanu Narayan. It's times like these you learn to live again. It's times like these you give Good morning. Welcome to Max 2019. With over 15,000 of you here in LA and thousands more watching online, we're part of the biggest Max ever. Thank you, thank you for joining us and thank you for making Max a movement. Max is the opportunity for us to connect as a community, to celebrate innovation, to be inspired by each other's ideas, and to take creativity to the next level. It's about creating the future, and it's also about celebrating where we've been. We recently celebrated the 20th anniversary of InDesign. Yeah. <laughs> while, I love, while I love all our products, InDesign is particularly special to me because it's the first major product that I worked on when I joined Adobe over 20 years ago. Our vision was to build a new product with a flexible architecture to make it the design platform for an entire generation. And we succeeded in providing unprecedented control for layout, for typography, including a revolutionary vertical text layout engine codenamed Hotaka, made specifically for Japan. InDesign gave publishers and designers the freedom to create in ways that seemed impossible. And even today, it is a digital publishing powerhouse. Looking around the corner and delivering the best products to fill unmet needs, it was what we've always aimed to do. When we launched Creative Cloud, our vision was to completely reimagine the creative process, providing new capabilities continuously and enabling you to create wherever inspiration strikes. We've delivered thousands of updates to our flagship applications, launched new products like Adobe XD, and integrated services such as Adobe Stock, Photoshop Brushes, as well as Adobe Fonts. We've taken a radical new approach to delivering products across multiple devices. And Lightroom, a product designed by a photographer for photographers, is now a multi-surface system. We've reimagined the role of mobile devices in creativity and delivered products like Adobe Scan, which is truly intelligent PDF creation for the mobile era. And I'm always blown away when I see Fresco in action, making drawing and painting come to life on a tablet. Finally, the ability to draw with a stylus rather than a mouse. But we aren't resting on our laurels. Today is all about sharing with you the next generation of innovation that's coming from Adobe. Our mission is simple and powerful. We want to change the world through digital experiences. And it is this purpose that has guided everything that we do for over three decades. With Creative Cloud, we're unleashing creativity, giving anyone, anywhere, the tools to express themselves. With Adobe Document Cloud, we're accelerating document productivity, enabling people and organizations to collaborate and transact business with PDFs. And with Adobe Experience Cloud, we are powering digital businesses of all sizes, helping them design and deliver engaging customer experiences. All of Adobe's 22,000 employees have a singular focus on empowering everyone to create experiences that inspire, transform industries, and move the world forward. I truly believe that we're in the golden age of creativity. Storytelling has never been more rich thanks to the innate desire to communicate and the power that we have today with digital technology. It is the foundation of arts, of culture. It's critical to education and entertainment. And it powers societal change as well as drives economic progress and breakthroughs. Because it doesn't matter if you're a designer, an engineer, a student, or a business owner, creativity today is a fundamental skill. And at the core, creativity is actually all about making emotional connections. 
Digital literacy helps students see things in a whole new light. And educators in the US realized that students were struggling to connect to Shakespeare. So the Royal Shakespeare Company and five artists, including Octavia, one of our Adobe creative residents, set out to change that. They're reimagining Shakespeare for the 21st century by transposing iconic scenes from Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth into the modern day, using photos, animation, and drawings, ensuring that the profound works of literature remain relevant and cherished by the next generation. Creativity today is education. Film connects us through powerful stories that transcend time, place, and culture. The Sky is Pink, directed by Shonali Bose, is one such story. Based on a true story, this beautiful and bittersweet epic tells the tale of a devoted couple seen through the eyes of their teenage daughter with pulmonary fibrosis. The Sky is Pink unites us in universal truths about life, love, and loss. Creativity today is entertainment. The power of imaging drives us to discover new frontiers. We have scientists and astronauts at NASA using Photoshop and Lightroom to translate grayscale data into images that allow our human eye to see the wonders of the universe. And Christina Cook, who was part of NASA's first ever all-female spacewalk, is helping us experience space and inspiring a new generation of creators and astronauts within our atmosphere and beyond. Photoshop truly is everywhere, even in outer space. And creativity today is exploration. The impact of design, though, extends far beyond aesthetics. It can change lives. Limitless Solutions is a nonprofit that brings together students from the design and engineering departments at the University of Central Florida to create custom bionic arms. These aren't generic prosthetics. They're works of art customized to each child's personality through designs like Iron Man and Floral Blooms that are made to make the kids feel like superheroes. Limitless unites art and science to address a real-world need, adding a bit of joy and beauty to the process. Creativity is definitely empowering. The common theme in all these stories for us is amazing things happen at the intersection of imagination and technology. And as I think about Adobe's role in shaping the coming decades of creativity, there are a few themes that guide our vision. We need to empower all voices, from creative professionals to students, astronauts, to office workers, we need to make accessible the power of rich media so anyone can tell their story. At Max, you'll be seeing updates to all our flagship applications, new products that seamlessly blend across devices, as well as a glimpse of what our product teams are working on in the labs, so that we can continue to reimagine the creative experience for everyone. We're pushing the boundaries of technology to give you new ways to express your vision. Voice, AR, VR, 3D, animation, video, Photoshop, illustration, screen design. We're innovating to make the world your canvas. We're accelerating productivity for both individuals as well as teams. Because we know that creators don't work in isolation, and the creative process involves multiple people across an organization developers, designers, marketers, and even all of you as end users. We want you to be more productive, and with assets now automatically stored in the cloud, you can create and collaborate wherever inspiration strikes. And we're putting Adobe Magic to work through Sensei. We're harnessing the power of hundreds of millions of assets that you are creating through our applications and learning from the millions of users who use our product every day to power our machine learning and artificial intelligence, helping you work faster and streamline your process more than ever before. 
AI is fundamentally transforming computing in powerful ways, and we see its potential to amplify human creativity, not replace it. As a company, we're also guided by our core principles of responsibility, transparency, and accountability to enable the thoughtful deployment of this technology in our products and understand the impact that they have on society. But more than technology, the real reason for this gathering is our commitment to the movement. To me, one of the really beautiful things about Creative Cloud is that it has enabled us to have an ongoing relationship with all of you. And it's your engagement and passion that's helped shape our product vision. Your participation is invaluable to this product innovation, so thank you. And it's cool to see how each one of you is also teaching and inspiring other people through your active engagement on Behance, which is now a community of over 18 million members and growing. All of you continue to inspire us through your ingenuity, through your imagination. And so we put together our own small tribute to celebrate this community that we all belong in. Can we roll the video, please? We'll begin with a spin traveling in the world of my creation. What we'll see will defy explanation. If you want to view paradise, simply look around and view it. Anything you want to do it, want to change the world, there's nothing to it. There is no life I know to compare with pure imagination. Living there, you'll be free if you truly wish to be. The golden age of creativity may be aided by technology, but it's only possible by you, the creators. You have vision. You dream big. And we're privileged to be part of what you do. Thank you for being here at Max, being part of our family, and inspiring us to do our best work. We can create a place that's more beautiful, more colorful, and together, we can change the world. And now I'd like to welcome our Chief Product Officer, Scott Belsky. Enjoy, Max. Uh, so uh, thank you, Sean Yu. Whoa. Hi, everyone. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's kick off this, Max, with uh, just a bit of perspective. All right? Creativity, imagination. I mean, these are the uniquely human traits that gave rise to civilization. Our predecessor species may have been stronger than us, and their brains were technically bigger, but they lacked the key ingredient that allowed people to organize and to collaborate, to solve problems in new ways, and believe in something bigger than themselves. They lacked imagination. The anthropologists believe there was probably some form of brain mutation that allowed us homo sapiens to imagine things and to conceive of a world beyond the physical. And it was that brain mutation that has allowed us to create. From the cave paintings of Lascaux, the great Sphinx of Giza, to Michelangelo's David, Hoxai's Great Wave, and Monet's Water Lilies, it's what keeps us creating as our style evolves and new forms of media rise up. It is this unique trait that brings us all here today, full of visions of possibility and beauty, of connection, of the future that we yearn to bring to life. Our imaginations are unlimited, but there's still something that holds us back. What limits us? Time. Time. Time spent searching the web for reference art, 
spent formatting and tagging and toiling over chores that inhibit our creativity, spent organizing every element of our work with collaborators and stakeholders, even the time spent learning how to use a product like Photoshop or Premiere Pro. Time is this narrow door that everything we want to create must pass. And so one of our top priorities for Creative Cloud and a theme of much of what you're gonna see today is to help you conquer time. And we know your time is precious and your aspirations are boundless. So we want Creative Cloud to unleash your full creative potential. And we are so excited to share the very latest with you today. So are you ready? All right, let's get started. So Creative Cloud's mission, as Shantanu was saying, is creativity for all. And I'm excited to talk about what we're doing for everyone of all ages and levels of experience. We are living in an age in which machines and artificial intelligence will replace many aspects of jobs and many jobs. And to succeed, everyone needs to be outfitted to do what only humans can do, be creative. And that starts in schools. Children around the world must develop creative literacy. They must know how to visually express themselves and stand out with their ideas. And so we are preparing the next generation by deploying Creative Cloud now to more than 15 million students worldwide. We are, <laughs> thanks. We, um, we're also fueling this shift with our Spark products, which empower anyone to make compelling, there's a Spark team maybe back there, <laughs> which empower anyone to make compelling social posts and put together their own videos, posters, and web pages. And so if you haven't tried Spark yet, check it out. Some of the greatest brands and social influencers around the world are using Spark to be creative and share ideas in real time every day on so many platforms. And then there's Photoshop Express, which over the last year has been used more than 1.8 billion times to do amazing things with mobile images. So we are fully committed to bringing creativity to all through these products and more to come. Before we jump into our pro products and today's themes, I want to express gratitude to the thousands of customers, including many of you, who have helped and shared feedback, participated in betas and user tests, and even let us watch you work. We have spent the last year understanding what frustrates you and obstructs your creativity, what will make you more productive as you work with others, and what you'd like to do with new mediums and techniques. Understanding how you create and what you need helped us define three principles for our work this year. First, we are making Creative Cloud faster, more powerful, and more reliable. Second, Creative Cloud now enables you to create anywhere, anytime, with anyone. And third, we're helping you explore new frontiers. So let's start with this first principle, all about performance, which prompts the question, what should you expect from modern tools and services that you use to create? They should start up fast, make your work easier, and be super reliable. As operating systems and hardware evolve, your expectation for power and performance go up, as they should and we can do a better job of meeting and exceeding these expectations, and we are committed to making it happen. Under the hood, we are fundamentally improving how we build products. We've made great strides this year, and we're excited to have you discover the many, many improvements throughout Creative Cloud. I'm happy to report that we have drastically reduced bugs, improved performance, and attacked crash rates across all of our products, and you will see a difference in things as simple as how quickly a new document loads in Photoshop, how solid and reliable cloud documents are, and how smoothly you can work with thousands of complex assets in XD. And yes, our teams still have a lot of work to do. You will continue to see progress on these fronts, update by update. Okay, now let's talk about creating anytime, anywhere, with anyone, creativity, has always happened on its own terms, wherever and whenever an idea strikes, and have, has th always thrived from collaboration. But for much of the digital era, creative tools have forced us to work alone down to our desks. 
And it's about time that we break through. You know, through the confinement of the desktop, the inability to create together, and the challenge of sharing assets and staying coordinated with our teams. Today, we will show you what's possible when we remove these limitations. Welcome to a world where you can just take Photoshop on the bus or paint with realistic oils and watercolors with no mess while you're sitting waiting for the plane and then finish up on Photoshop desktop at home. And spoiler alert, we are going to give you the first glimpse ever at how we will extend another one of our most popular apps beyond the desktop. Uh, we are also going to share some significant updates today to how you collaborate more efficiently. The new Creative Cloud libraries and the design system technology in Adobe XD help you conquer time in more ways than ever before. They make it easy to share assets and components to ensure consistency, and they empower creative teams to work together seamlessly. Finally, let's talk about exploring new frontiers. One of the most exciting new frontiers in creativity is 3D and immersive creation. And whether it's for mediums like virtual and augmented reality, or designing 3D objects for games or modern e-commerce experiences, Creative Cloud now offers the very best tools to bring your ideas into the third dimension. This year, we welcomed the Substance Suite, often referred to as the Photoshop of 3D into the Adobe family. And we're launching the first version of Adobe Aero today, which helps you create augmented reality projects using tools you already know, like Photoshop and Dimension. But pushing frontiers isn't just about adopting new tools and creating for new mediums. It's also about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and developing new creative skills. What's the best way to take your skills to the next level or to learn something entirely new? Ultimately, it's actually looking over an expert's shoulder and watching them create. And so we're enabling that kind of learning on a massive scale in Creative Cloud with new features like step-by-step -step tutorials for master, from master photographers in Lightroom. And we're helping you learn on Behance. Nearly a million people viewed live streamed content on Behance this year, watching on average more than an hour in each session. And next year, we're gonna give you the ability to live stream your work direct, directly from your tools just the same way that the best game design, game, gamers do using Twitch, so that everyone can learn from you and you can learn from others. And hey, it's not just about learning. I mean, isn't it mesmerizing to watch an artist at work and understand why that happy little tree gets placed there? Well, that's, that's part of the future as well. I could not resist paying homage to Bob Ross, so thanks for indulging me. All right. Um, OK, so you're about to see a lot of improvements to our flagship applications, but Creative Cloud isn't just about the tools. Just as important are all of the services that tie those tools together. So we have made incredible updates to Creative Cloud libraries and the new Creative Cloud desktop app that will make your work so much easier. And I'm gonna show you this for myself. So here we are. This is actually the new Creative Cloud desktop application that some of you may have discovered and some of you may have not. And this is where this is really the central place for everything creative. So you can see all of my desktop apps here, but also the mobile apps, web apps, everything are now accessible in one place. I also love the new categories. So this is actually a way for you to find the right tool for you at every level of expertise across every category covered by Creative Cloud. And then these new product pages are essentially micro communities for every single product in Creative Cloud. So I can jump into Photoshop, and then I have just tons of courses, resources, um, inspiration content, but also links to the forums and top topics and everything else. So uh, don't miss um, just the way of navigating apps now in, in Creative Cloud Desktop. Of course, the resource links to services like Stock, Fonts, Behance, everything is all here as well. I also kind of like the new search in, in, in Creative Cloud Desktop. So this actually allows you to find you know, obviously everything right at your fingertips for every search term. And of course, apps help content and everything related for what you're searching. But also all the stock content that you might need based on a search query um, now can just be accessed here. And then your work. So this is really cool. Creative Cloud Library is now in almost every application across Creative Cloud. Um, and then now everything from all of your libraries that are shared with you or that you made yourself are all um, searchable and filterable all from one place in the Creative Cloud desktop application. Um, jumping into this new section, your work. I mean, you can see what we're doing here. So this is the 
Creative Hub library for Adobe Max 2019. You can see all the graphics, character styles, brushes. I mean, everything that goes into making a conference like this is all aggregated into one place. And of course, I can share this library with anyone. So uh, libraries are super easy to manage. You can drag and drop now. You can really manage libraries centrally uh, easier than ever before. But you can also now public, public, follow public libraries. And this is really cool. This is a ways for companies, brands, um, manufacturers, or operating systems to have source of truth libraries that anyone can follow along. So Google Material Design, you actually can see I already synced that one. And, you know, here I have it as well. So it's just a great, again, central way to manage everything creative. The last cool thing I'll just show you is that we are also bringing libraries to third-party apps. And so here I'm in PowerPoint, and you can see here's Creative Cloud. And then finally, I can keep all those folks across Teams in sync with library integration and the third-party apps. Pretty cool. So that's the all-new Creative Cloud desktop app. It's on desktop. It's also mobile, and it's available now. And this is just the start. The team has ambitious plans for this app to help you work with others, manage your assets centrally, and more. When you take a step back and consider the breadth of apps that are now linked through Creative Cloud, it's clear that no other service makes creativity so connected. OK, so we have a lot of amazing stuff to share with you today. So let's dive right in. Please welcome Terry White, who's going to show you some of the most requested. He has some fans out there. That's great. Uh, some requested new features we've added to our products. Um, really major improvements I know you'll love. And how we're using Adobe Sensei, the artificial intelligence engine behind a lot of what we do to help you create more in record time. Terry. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> I am so excited to be here today to not only show you some of my favorite new features across desktop and mobile, but also some of the performance enhancements along the way. So let's get to it. Well, speaking of performance, I'm going to start here in Photoshop, and this may seem like a little thing, but if you've ever created a new document in Photoshop and you wonder why that new document dialog box takes three, four, or five seconds to come up, you'll be happy to know that it's now instantaneous. A little thing, but it goes a long way every single day. Next up, let's talk about free transform. Last year, I introduced not having to hold down the shift key. We got your feedback. And now you want that experience to not only be consistent across pixel and vector layers, but you want to be able to toggle it based on your preference. And that preference is now sticky. So whatever you choose, that's the way it's going to be. So let's go into warp, one of my favorite new capabilities. Now, I, I switched to warp. I didn't get the standard 3x3 three three grid because I can go from 3x3 three three all the way up to 5x5, five five, and, and if that's not enough, I can click to add my own custom points wherever I need them along the way, and I get the ability to hold down the Shift key and select multiple points at the same time so that I can transform this flower to make it a little wider and a little taller, just like that. <laughs> Next up, let's take a look at making selections. In the past, I might have used Adobe Sensei's power select subject, which in this case, it would think all of the food is the subject. But what if I only want one thing? Now, with the new object select tool, even in the shape of a rectangle, I can just go ahead and make a selection, and Adobe Sensei figures out what I was trying to select and does it for me. <laughs> even if I come down to a pepper and do that, it figures out that I wanted the pepper and makes that selection for me. Now, wait, what if it's more intricate? The tool can be switched from a rectangle to a lasso so that even if I go around one of the zucchini, and I'm using a mouse to do this so this won't be pretty, I go around it and Adobe Sensei figures out that I only wanted the one and does it for me. <laughs> Selections will never be the same going forward. But wait. Why do we make selections in the first place? We typically make selections so that we can take the object off the background or remove the background. Well, what if Adobe Sensei could do that all in one step for you? What if it could figure out what the subject is and remove it from the background in one click with one new button here in the Properties panel called Remove Background? Just like that. Now, I know what you're thinking. That was too quick. I've got to see that again on a different image. Click. Yep, it does it on that one, too. And this truly is how Skynet got started. All right, switching gears. 
Now, this beautiful image created by artist Isabel LeMay, she creates these images from scratch with literally hundreds if not thousands of layers. And this is a five gigabyte file, so we're gonna talk about performance, but more importantly, when you get a file like this, especially from an artist, typically the layers may not be named as best they could. <laughs> so in this case, I've got a lot of background copies here, but that's okay. I need to know what's on the layer, so now with the new zoom to layer capability, I can hold down my option key and just click, and it will zoom to that layer and show me what's on it. I can isolate it and then name that layer, and let's do that one more time. Zoom to layer, isolate the layer, see what's on it, and know exactly what's on my layers going forward with extreme performance now in Photoshop. Now I'm gonna switch gears, we're gonna switch over to Illustrator. Illustrator's all about vectors, and of course in this version, it's all about performance as well. I've got literally thousands of vectors selected here. But wait, let's zoom out because that's gonna take a minute, right? Nope, instantaneous, zooming with thousands of vectors in Illustrator GPU performance is amazing. <laughs> I love it. Now, wait about, what, what about drawing those paths? Now again, I, I mentioned that I don't have my Wacom stylus here, I'm just using a mouse, so this is not gonna be great. I'll do the best I can. Too many points. Well, with a new, improved, simplify path, I can go to path, simplify, and it, it figures out, hey, we don't need that many points for that path. Let's take it from 28 down to four without changing the shape just like that. So you, you'll love those inform, imp, imp, improvements on simplify path in Illustrator. Now, switching gears to InDesign. InDesign gets a speed boost. It now launches 25% faster than the previous version. But the problem we're going to solve today is the client doesn't like that image. <laughs> I'm trying not to take it personally, because I took this image in Malmo, Sweden, of the turning torso. But they want a different tower. I don't have a different tower. So now in InDesign, I can right-click, find similar images. It will source Adobe Stock go out and look for images like this, show me tower images, I see the one I want, I just drag it over, I can replace that one with this one, and if it's too big, I can select it and use the new or improved content-aware fit to fit it down. Now, if, I don't, if, I, if they do like that one, I can even license this image right on the canvas without having to go back to the library and figure out where I got it from. All right, now speaking of images, Thank you. Speaking of images, as a photographer, I love Lightroom. I use Lightroom every single day. And I've got Lightroom here running on an Android device. And what's new in Lightroom that I love now, both on mobile and desktop, are new interactive tutorials. And you might think, oh, tutorials, it's another video. No. If I tap on this tutorial by Randy, and start the tutorial, the first thing it does is it downloads the image into my device so I can continue working. It then walks me through step by step the steps that Randy took to get this, and that little guide is showing me what sliders to move. If I move the slider and I go a different way, it's okay, I can experiment with what that slider does to see what Clarity does, but then I can go ahead and lock it in on the one I'm supposed to. Then I go to the next tab for lighting, I can see what exposure does, and then still come back to where I'm supposed to in this tutorial. And I can keep going through and see shadows, see what shadow detail will do until I'm on, uh, on the spot that I'm supposed to be on. Now, that's step-by-step -step interactive tutorials. But wait, there's more. Let's go back, close this, scroll up to the discovery area. Because in the discovery area, it's not so much about learning step-by-step, -step, it's about seeing cool images and techniques, tapping on one, and instead of you walking through step by step, you can just scroll through the edits to see what they were. And if you like the look of this final image, you can go in and download that as a preset to apply to your images going forward. All in Lightroom on mobile and desktop. I've got one more thing. Let's head back to Photoshop. Speaking of capturing the look of things, I love the colors in this image. If I wanted to create a color theme in the past, I might have pulled out my phone, used Adobe Capture, and pointed maybe at the screen or at the scene to capture those color themes. Well, today, we no longer have to worry about that because we're bringing the capture experience to the desktop for the first time. So I can go in to my libraries, 
click the plus sign, and there's a new option, Create from Image, and it brings up the Adobe Capture experience right in Photoshop. So I can capture patterns for the first time seamlessly, vector shapes, color themes, which is what I want. So I can drag the color stops around to get the exact color themes that I want. Once I do that, I can save it to my library, and for the first time, both on mobile and desktop, seamless gradients from your image or from a source file. Here we go, if I need more stops, no problem. I can drag the slider, get more stops, and get the exact color themes that I'm looking for seamlessly, all in Adobe Capture on the desktop for the first time. And those are just a few. <laughs> and those are just a few of my favorite things on the desktop and mobile, as well as performance enhancements. Back to you, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Terry. So those are just some of the new features and improvements sitting our flagship products today. Um, so as you can see, there are a lot more. Uh, and a lot of these are the result of your feedback. So thanks again for your input this year. Please keep it coming. Uh, now, Terry mentioned stock during his demo. Now, stock now offers a grand total of over 180 million assets, including 13 million videos, 32 million vector assets, motion graphics, illustrations, everything you need to start building a great project. It's just growing, so be sure to check out the latest in stock. Okay, shifting gears. It was just about 30 years ago that we launched Photoshop. You remember? Um, who remembers the first time they used Photoshop? All right. <laughs> I was 13, setting up a new computer at my parents' dining room table. Opening up Photoshop gave me this feeling of infinite possibilities. And over the decade, Photoshop has changed creativity more than any other application in the world. Last year, we shared a preview of Photoshop on the iPad. The project required us to reimagine Photoshop from the ground up. We transformed the interface for a mobile, touch-based world. We made the power of Photoshop more accessible and easier to learn. And we developed a new way to work with PSDs in the cloud, just as we've done with Lightroom and XD files, so that your projects show up across devices and you can pick up right where you left off. And when we shared the application with our pre-release community, one benefit people mentioned often was a sensation of being so close to your pixels the physical connection you get when you're holding your work in your hand and making changes naturally. And so we are super excited to extend the Photoshop family to the iPad today. The, uh, so this first version of Photoshop for iPad is perfect for compositing, easy masking, and retouching. And here to show you this revolutionary application is my colleague, Emily Bogue. Emily. Thank you, Scott. Good morning. What an unreal honor to be here launching the very first version of Photoshop right here on the iPad. Let's jump right into a quick overview. So the first thing you'll notice is the experience is intuitive. On the left, I have my core Photoshop compositing tools. On the right, I have easy access to my layers, all those things I want to do with them, and my properties panel with different options depending on my layer type. So it's intuitive, it's so easy to just get started, and we've really focused on optimizing the experience for the iPad with new features like this focus layers view, which lets me keep my eyes on the canvas as I'm jumping in and out of groups and going about my work, and optimizations specifically for the touch environment. So always interacting with gestures wherever possible, like here in the header where I can just scrub to zoom in and out. We've even added a brand new touch shortcut. You can see it here, fully draggable around the screen. This gives me quick access to secondary actions depending on where I tap in the app when I hold it down with my thumb. So here in the Layers panel, for example, I can just tap to multi-select. And depending on what tool I'm in, like here in Move, where I can just swipe to duplicate really gives me these touch acceleration points that make working on the iPad quick and easy. So it's intuitive, it's optimized, but we know none of that matters if performance isn't fast, because when you're working in Photoshop, sometimes you can have hundreds, 
thousands of layers in the blink of an eye, huge files, and this is just one such PSD. You know, I began it on the desktop, it's over a gigabyte, it's got more than 500 layers, but performance stays smooth as I scroll through them all, and even as I zoom down into that very last pixel and bounce all the way back out. So, thank you. It's intuitive, it's optimized, it's fast, and most importantly, it's just a ton of fun to play with. So let's get started making something. And where better to begin than by making something totally new all right here on the iPad. So as I jump into creating a new document, you'll see that familiar screen, all those presets you know from the desktop. In this case, I have a custom one ready to go. Really easy to just get started. And I'll bring in a few images from my background from those same libraries Scott and Terry have been talking about. It's where I keep all my inspiration, my assets, like this moss, which is that texture I love. But you can see you know, that bright sky is not exactly the look I'm going for here. And just like on desktop, I have those tools I need to start my selection, like Lasso. And you'll see here as I complete my selection, on the iPad, we've really optimized that experience for the touch environment with that bottom bar. Surfaces those things I want to do next, like mask. And here in the layers panel, you'll see when it's added, I'm dropped right into it so I can just start brushing to smooth out those edges and get a really nice blend going between my layers here. Let's bring all this together a little bit more using Gaussian Blur. Now, this is one of the most popular filters in Photoshop, really powerful for creating this depth of field effect. And we'll just unify the composition through color using global adjustment layers Really powerful. These work just like they do in desktop. You can see as I tweak the color here, I can get just that tone I want. And I can go back and edit this at any time here on the desktop today or next year. Great. So my background is ready. Now let's add a magical element, really make this composition pop. And back here in my libraries, I have this mushroom I've been wanting to use. You can see as I start this selection with my quick select tool, you know, it's the style I love, kind of a video game toadstool, but it's going to need a little work to really pop in this composition. And as I extend that selection using the lasso, something I really love about using the iPad and the Apple Pencil is that this actually feels really natural, even on stage in front of 20,000 people. <laughs> it's just like tracing. Actually breathes new life into this tool, which cannot always be the most fun to use with a mouse. <laughs> there we go. Again, I'm right in that mask, so I can just soften it using Gaussian Blur. And then clean up those edges, taking full advantage of all that pressure sensitivity of the Apple Pencil. Really natural. Gets that mushroom right where I want it. OK. So now let's add that pop of magic I was talking about, right? And here in the Layers Properties panel, we've made it really easy to add clipped adjustment layers. Now, this is something people want to do all the time, even if they don't know about clipping, and that's change the adjustment changed a property of just one layer. So as I add QSAT here, you can see, I'll bring up the saturation. Only that mushroom is starting to glow. And again, I, that mask is added for me, so I can just start brushing to bring down where I've blown it out in the cap. That is the precision I expect from Photoshop. Cool. <laughs> so. I've got this lighting effect coming together. Let's really heighten that by playing with blend modes. And here, I've got those blend modes I want, like overlay, which is my favorite for this type of work with glowing light. It's really easy to just grab a color, brighten it up a little bit. And as I start brushing here, again, full pressure sensitivity of the Apple Pencil, you can see immediately that mushroom is starting to glow. Really looks like the cap's illuminated. And then I can just go back in, add a little highlight every, anywhere I think it hits the rest of the image. And now that I'm thinking about that play between the glowing mushroom and the moss below, let's bring that even further with one more clipped layer. I can bring down that exposure and then just start painting on that mask to show a little light from that original layer beneath. Such a subtle effect. Really feels like I'm painting with light here. Cool. So I blended my elements together. I've created this dramatic play between light and dark. Now, let's just top it off with a little fun. Back here in my libraries, I have some sparkle in the form of these fireflies. And this is another great place to use my blend modes, like screen. Makes it really easy to just bring only the light into the image. 
saves me so much time, and then I can just create one more level of depth using Gaussian Blur. There we go. In just a few minutes, I've gone from a totally blank canvas to this magical, completely non-destructively created composition, all in Photoshop and all right here on the iPad. Thank you. Now, everything we've seen so far is available on the iPad today. But there's one more thing I want to show you, and that's a quick sneak at just a few of the ways we're bringing our most powerful Sensei technologies from Photoshop on the desktop right here to the iPad very, very soon. Now, this is still under development, but keep your apps updated because it's coming very soon. <laughs> and to start this one, I'll just jump into this cloud document I have, kind of an underwater composition I've got going, bridging these two worlds. I'll just make a quick edit, bringing in one more turtle. I never have too many turtles here. And of course, you know, the next thing I want to do, sort of integrate this more tightly into the composition, start a selection, mask it out. And as we've seen already on the iPad today, I have options. I could use Quick Select, I could use my lasso tool, you know, if I really wanted that fine grained control, but it's a little time consuming, uh, kind of error prone if I am on the bus, as Scott said. Of course, there's an easier way. If I were on the desktop, I would just use Select Subject. And we're bringing that full Sensei power of Select Subject right here to the iPad. All, yeah, all I have to do is tap this button. And there we go. I have to pause because if you blinked, you missed it, like in Terry's demo. In the tap of a button, Sensei has analyzed my layer, identified my subject, and started my selection for me. It saved me so much time in tracing. Really feels like magic here on the iPad. So that's select subject coming soon here to the iPad. And for this next sneak, I'll bring in an intrepid explorer to bridge these two worlds. This guy's up to the task. Of course, now that I have select subject, I'll use that to start. And it gets me 99% of the way there. But, you know, it never hurts to have a human touch. And of course, this type of hair is always tricky to select. If I were on the desktop, I would just use the Refine Edge brush. And again, we're bringing that full Sensei power of Refine Edge right here to the iPad. So let me give you a quick sneak. Just like on the desktop, all I have to do is start brushing to tell Sensei where I've got a complicated edge and I want it to focus its magic. And there we go. I sit back. It does all the heavy lifting. If you take a look at that mask mode, you can see. Every curl, every hair, perfectly selected. All I have to do is add any refinements I want, like decontaminate, and tap done. There's our little guy, all his beautiful curls, perfectly masked, all right here on the iPad. Again, thank you. I have to pause for a minute because this is so seamless that the full power can easily get lost, but it is impossible to make this type of complicated selection this quickly and this precisely without Refine Edge and all that Sensei power. It's just one more example of how we're bringing that power and precision you expect from Photoshop right here to the iPad. So to finish this composition, I'll just turn back on a few effects to focus the eye, and there we go. Select Subject, Refine Edge, these are just two of the amazing Sensei technologies we're bringing from Photoshop on the desktop here to the iPad very, very soon. And like everything else you've seen today, this is just the beginning. So if you already use Photoshop, download the app, load in a few projects, just start working. And if you're new to Photoshop or maybe you've been overwhelmed by the desktop in the past, give us a try on iPad because this is just the place to start. Thank you so much. Back to you, Scott. So uh, thanks, Emily. If you are a Creative Cloud customer with Photoshop, Photoshop on iPad is included in your plan starting today. It's also available on the App Store. And we have a really exciting uh, roadmap ahead, as Emily said. So super excited. Uh, now, as Shantanu said earlier, 
we want everyone to have the creative skills to tell a story, their story, in a compelling way. And there's no better way to develop your creative literacy than through drawing and painting. Drawing and painting really do unite the mind, the body, and the imagination. And we developed Adobe Fresco to help everyone experience that, powering, that, that liberating power uh, of creation. What makes Fresco the world's greatest drawing and painting application? Well, Fresco has all of the technical tools digital artists need, including the ability to use vectors and powerful, versatile Photoshop brushes. But what really sets Fresco apart are the live brushes. Adobe scientists spent years studying real oil and watercolor paints. Fresco's live brushes reproduce those media more accurately and realistically than any other application out there, making the experience of painting and drawing in Fresco natural and expressive. Here to show you what you can do with Fresco is the one and only Kyle Webster. Kyle. Hello. OK, thank you, Scott. Uh, how's my hair? Good? I could spend my time up here telling you all about the professional features we have baked into the app, vector brushes, round trip to Photoshop, layer blending, masking, and so on. But what I really want to do is just show you how much fun it is to paint. So I've got a watercolor brush here, and I'm just going to put a little color on my canvas like so. And maybe this is small and you can't really see what I'm doing, so why don't I zoom in? Because I really think you're going to notice the magic when I add a secondary color. When that yellow touches that red, look at that gorgeous blend into the orange, just like the real thing. Now, these watercolors we control with two simple sliders, water and how much paint you have on your brush, just like a watercolorist would want. And sometimes I just sit there and I blend colors with no real purpose because it's just fun to look at it, frankly. All right, I'm going to add a little bit of purple down here in the corner. And every time it touches that red, we get a nice new color. And I'll just pull it up this way. Mm -hmm. Delightful. And a little bit of a bright blue. And every time it touches, oh, watch that. It touches that purple and we get a gorgeous violet color coming through. It's just so fun to blend these colors in such a naturalistic way. And if I want them to be wetter, I just crank up the water, and I get a lot of nice bleeding effects like that. Maybe some of you have figured out what I'm painting here. Maybe not, but maybe it'll be obvious the moment I add that. OK, this is a toucan, one of my favorite birds, one of my kids' favorite birds. And what I love about toucan is it rhymes with you can. And I know that you can create beautiful art with this app because really it's as simple as just picking up a brush and going for it. So we'll add a little green there. If I want to go back to that yellow I used earlier, it's so easy because I have a color history panel right here waiting for me. So I never have to worry about, oh, what was that color I was using earlier? It's already there. No problemo. All right. I, sometimes I need a little bit of a detail. And for detail, I need a detail brush. And I've got a detail brush right here. And I'm going to use a darker color. And you'll notice that I'm able to bring that brush to a very fine point, just like that. And this is because this brush will respond to that pressure sensitivity. So more pressure, wider mark. Less pressure, less so. Let's give him a little eyeball. It's important for him to be able to see his environment. Very nice. Here's something I couldn't do in the real world, which is pick up an eraser and just start wiping away some watercolor. Put a highlight right there, a little highlight in the eye. Couldn't be simpler. I'm going to go now to my wash brush and just bring some of that color down. And then I'm going to do something really fun, which is paint with pure water. Now, with Fresco, all you have to do is select your color wheel at the bottom right corner. You'll notice we have a transparent circle. The moment I select that and then use a nice soft wash brush, all I'm doing is adding water to the canvas. So look at how that all blends together. Beautiful. I'm not adding paint. I'm just painting with water. So I think our little guy looks pretty happy, but he needs a place to live. And I'll tell you something else I like about working in a digital environment. I can take anything I've made, I can enlarge it, I can rotate it, I can reposition it on the canvas, like so. Can't do that with paper. Sorry, paper, I love you, but let's get serious here. All right, now you know I love Photoshop brushes, and I've got some of my favorite Photoshop brushes saved right here. And I'm going to use a foliage brush. Now, a foliage brush means, literally, I'm going to paint foliage with a couple of taps like that. It's almost like cheating, but that's OK. We'll use a little lighter color on top for some highlight, and then I'll grab a leafy line brush, paint some leaves. Look at that. Very nice. And another leafy line brush. Why not? Since we've got it, go over there. Select a slightly lighter color, maybe. I'm just having fun. This is 
the whole point. And I love spatter. Nothing's ever done without spatter, so we've got to throw some spatter on top of everything. Why? Because I said so. There we go. Spatter. Let's do some yellow spatter. How pretty is that? Now, here's something cool. I go back to my watercolor brush, and when I paint over what I've just done with Photoshop brushes, mind you, everything gets wet again. See that? So these areas that I'm painting are picking up all the color that was just put down with the Photoshop brush, but since I'm using a watercolor brush, it's going to make it wet. And that gives you a whole other range of possibilities for your painting. I think we need a little more spatter, don't you? There we go. OK, great. Now, let's take him and move him over here, blow him up a little bit. And next, I'm going to dry the paper. Simple as this, I say dry layer. And what this allows me to do now is if I go back to that detail brush I was using, I can paint on top of this. And it's going to still acknowledge that there's color underneath, and it's going to blend all that color. But the lines I'm painting, the shapes I'm painting, have a clear, crisp edge. So essentially, we give you three ways to use watercolor in fresco. You can use it wet into wet, wet on top of dry, or wet on top of paint that's still sitting on the paper. This is really, really powerful. So I think I'll add a little circle around the eye, like so. And there we have a happy toucan living in a happy forest, looking at his environment. And the thing about toucans is, like, are they ever unhappy? They must look in the mirror and say, oh, everything's good, right? All that bright color. That took me a couple of minutes. Watercolor, Photoshop brushes, boom, we've got a nice illustration. But I want to move on because I want to show you something with oils. For hundreds of years, artists have been using oils to create these rich, textured paintings with tons of depth. And I'm just going to zoom in here for a moment because what I really want you to see is the rich, textured, detailed surface of this painting as I pan around here. It looks like the real thing. And what gets really fun is when I start to take my brush and just push all that paint around. So I can blend a little bit with light pressure, or I can really dig in. And you can see the bristles actually pulling that paint. And over here, you'll notice there's a little bit of canvas texture coming through. Now, that canvas comes through because I'm using light pressure and I'm just grazing the surface. All right, now, if I select some color and then really dig in, look at that. Ooh, it all blends together. So much fun. OK, now, to finish off this painting, what I really think we need to do is give this farmer some more detail. So I'm going to jump out of full screen mode and select an oil painting detail brush. Got it right here. Since we have a sunny day, you can see the shadows are coming down from the trees there. What I want to do is add some sun to the brim of the hat and the top of the hat. And simple as doing this, a little bit of color. There we go. The lighter the pressure is that I use, the more it picks up the underlying color and blends it in. And I'm going to use a bright green to pop that collar out, draw on the shoulder a little bit there, and down the arm. The other shoulder, the forearm, just like that, we're giving some form to this figure. And I think we need to get this leg to come forward. All I have to use is a lighter value of that deep, dark color. And if I do this, then we get the impression that that leg is bending and coming forward. And just like that, we have a painting that, honestly, if you were to print this out and hand it to somebody, it looks like real oil paint, except that now I can use undo and layers. So again, cheating, but in the best possible way, right? So folks, listen, any artist can start with a thumbnail sketch in fresco and go all the way through to a final high-resolution piece of art and give it to their client. But what I love most about this app is it brings me back to that feeling I had as a kid, the pure joy of just creating something new through the act of drawing and painting. Thank you very much. It's kind of, kind of mesmerizing, huh? Uh, so thanks, Kyle. We shipped a new version of Fresco for iPad this morning with a ton of great new features. So hopefully you check it out. And today. We're very excited to launch versions of Fresco for select Windows and Surfic devices and the Wacom Mobile Studios. Fresco is powerful and versatile enough for professionals, artists, and illustrators, but we want everyone to engage in the art of drawing. And so that's why we're offering Adobe Fresco as a free application with the option of upgrading for unlimited brushes and a few other premium features. And the premium version of Fresco is available in select Creative Cloud plans um, since we launched a few weeks ago, people have already created over a million drawings and paintings in the app. And since everything you create in Fresco is saved as a Photoshop cloud document, you can open your work in Photoshop on desktop or iPad to add more effects. And, and this is really what we mean 
when we talk about turning our desktop products into multi-platform cloud-based systems. These systems make it easier to create anywhere, anytime, and collaborate with anyone. So what about the rest of Creative Cloud? What other desktop applications can become systems? Well, today, we are proud to give you a preview of the next step in our evolution, Adobe Illustrator on the iPad. So this, this, this really is graphic design reimagined. You get all the precision and versatility of Illustrator, but designed for touch. You'll be able to open projects on the iPad and then finish on Illustrator on the desktop, and you'll have everything you need to build your project, share it with collaborators, and get quickly to a finished logo, graphic, or illustration. Reengineering Illustrator for the iPad gave us a chance to also question our assumptions and really rethink the status quo. And I think you're going to see an Illustrator that's not just mobile, but a lot more intuitive and easier to use. And to show you Illustrator on the iPad for the first time ever, please welcome Eric Snowden and Dipanjana Chakravarti. Great, thanks, Scott. So we're really excited to be here to show you Illustrator for the very first time. In similar to Photoshop and Adobe Fresco, Illustrator is part of a broader system. And using cloud documents, I can see everything that's been created on the desktop or the iPad all in the same place. And I'm going to open up this pretty complex drawing here on my iPad. And this is really important because the team is focused on performance as a first-class citizen in this app. So it moves really fast. It's super smooth. And this drawing has tens of thousands of objects in it, but the iPad and Illustrator can handle it with ease. I'm going to go ahead and open up a second file, and I'm going to create a few different logos using a few different techniques. So the first thing I want to show here is the new Rethought Pencil Tool. So the Pencil Tool in Illustrator and the Apple Pencil are an amazing pairing together. So I can start by drawing by just tapping on my screen, and I'm creating a few straight lines, which is pretty straightforward. When I get to the end of a line, I can tap and drag and create really smooth vector curves using natural fluid motion. And so for those of you who have maybe been a little bit intimidated by Illustrator in the past, it's incredibly easy to create vectors right here on the iPad. Now, for those of you who are comfortable with the pen tool and have used it quite a bit, we've also rethought how that works for touch devices and the Apple Pencil. So I'm going to start by creating a basic shape here, doing tracing, something I do uh, quite a bit here in Illustrator. And you'll notice if I click and drag, I start to get um, exact percentages. I get a ton of detail. I'm going to start dragging and just creating the rest of this very quickly. And I'm getting good snapping. And so I've made a few mistakes here I want to edit. I want to get rid of this extra anchor point. All I do is click the Delete button. The anchor point goes away. I've actually made an extra point here that I want to get rid of. And now we have Smart Delete for Illustrator on the iPad. And so when I delete that point, it doesn't actually change my vector curve. So it's really great being able to selectively edit um, individual vectors. If I want to move a point along a path, in the past it would really push and pull the shape. But I can actually drag this point um, along an exact path and move it exactly where I want without transforming the shape. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And I've also got the ability to change things by exact pixel increments. So if I scrub here on my X and Y, I can get very, very precise. And that's really important when using Illustrator. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this up by drawing a little I here. Um, and now I want to tweak the type. I'm really not happy with this typography. And so if I select this piece of text and I go into my, um, my properties here, I can actually change the size. I can change spacing everything right here on screen without digging through a lot of complicated menus. But if I do go into my Properties panel, it's really easy to try out different fonts on the screen. I can click and drag and actually preview different fonts instantly on the screen in my design to see how things look. And if I decide none of these are quite the right font, I can tap, and I'll get access to all 17,000 Adobe fonts right here within Illustrator. I can pick one I like and finish up my design. So the last thing I want to show here, um, again, is a really common workflow where you draw something on a piece of paper, you take a photo, you bring it into Illustrator, and you trace it all over again. And we think there's a much better way using Sensei. So if I select this image, 
and I go into my drawing guide, Sensei is gonna analyze this image, find all the underlying shapes, and create an amazing trace for me right here on the iPad. And you'll notice, if I go in to edit this, I have very few points, but I have total control, so if I decide I wanna change something that Sensei did, it helps me get started, but it doesn't take any of the control away from me. Now, that was a pretty simple example. What if I have a drawing that looks like this? It's on a rough background, there's a stain, it's actually not drawn very precisely. Sensei can still handle this image. And again, it's looking at all the underlying shapes and reconstructing all the vectors here for me and creates an amazing tracing of this. And because I have control, I can go into this image and I can actually edit the underlying construction shapes that will then change the entire vector. So if I end up changing the outside or these individual things, I get a ton of control, including all the points that I want. So just new ways of creating vectors right here on the iPad. So those are a few of the basic drawing and typography controls. I'm gonna pass it off to DePontina to show some of the more expressive capabilities we're bringing to the iPad. Thanks, Eric. So let's take a look at some of these expressive capabilities. I'm going to talk about the first feature, symmetry. I've got this drawing right here, and this fairly symmetric as the left and the right side are absolutely identical. And as is the problem with such drawings, the minute I edit one side, those edits don't get carried on to the other, and I have to repeat that process all over again. But with Illustrator on the iPad, we can simply use the symmetry mode. So I will go and delete this one half that I had initially flipped, and with the other half selected, I go right here and say symmetry. And you can see that it has mirrored and reflected one side for me. I will go in and edit some details now. I start by editing this path right here. And I move around this circle as well. All right, to finish up, I just draw the antenna on one side. Okay, now to exit, I simply tap out, and now when I tap back in, it behaves like an ordinary object, which means that I can apply any transformations. And if I want to edit this a little bit further, all I have to do is just go right in, and it's always connected and always editable. So that was the symmetry mode. Let's move on to more new things. The next feature is called radial repeat. I have this form here, and I want to rotate and repeat it in a circle. How I do it today is I duplicate, and I rotate, and in the process, I've done some fairly complex bit of mathematics to figure out the angles that I need and the instances that I want, and I feed them manually in a dialog box. That sounds like a lot of work, right? We can make this insane process much simpler by using radial repeat. So with my form selected, I go right here and say radial repeat. And you can see that it has rotated these instances for me. I can now change the radius. I can increase or decrease the number of instances. And I just went up to 100 and back in a quick motion and I can also swivel it around for more formations. Just like symmetry, I tap out to exit, and when I tap back in, I can continue to edit this. So that was radial repeat. Let's move on to the last piece. I have this leaf here, and I want to cover this entire background with a leaf-like pattern. And just like before, I can start by duplicating. But you know what? I don't even want to attempt it because with the new feature pattern repeat, this is going to take seconds. So with my leaf selected right here, I go and say pattern repeat, and there you go. It started me off with a basic grid-like pattern. I can now place it anywhere I want, increase the bounds to cover a larger area much quickly, I can play with these on-canvas widgets to adjust the spacing. 
and it's starting to come together, but it looks a little bland, right? So I will go into the properties panel to add a little flavor to this. I'll start by changing the grid type to a drop type of grid right here. All right, I tweak it further. I go on columns and do a flip Y, do the same to the rows. All right, now. I want to add a little more detail that I hadn't quite done in the beginning. So just like before, I enter the isolated instance. And something to note now is that I had created this leaf in the symmetry mode. So all I'm doing is this drawing on one side, and it draws on the other. And it's drawing on the entire pattern as well instantaneously. Now, I will finish up by drawing a little more detail. Little more detail right here, and there you go. So that was pattern repeat to create complex patterns in a matter of minutes. And Illustrator on the iPad is a complete system with Illustrator on the desktop, which, which means that you can move from one to another seamlessly. And this was just a few of the features for Illustrator on the iPad today. We can't wait to see what you guys make with it. Thank you. So thank you, Dipanjana and Eric. So we are looking forward to bringing Illustrator to the iPad in 2020. Uh, and we're all really excited about it. And so uh, shifting gears, uh, let's talk a little bit about experience design. The past few years feel like a never-ending conversation about how important design is, how it's a competitive advantage at modern companies, and how designers should be at the center of product development. And so I'd like to welcome a person with whom I talk a lot about this, Adobe's Vice President of Design, Jamie Myrold. Thanks, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Wow. Before I start, I just have to say, what about Illustrator on my iPad? Is that amazing? Every time I see it. Anyway, I'm so happy to be here today to talk about experience design. Uh, why? Because my team, um, I head up a global experience design team here at Adobe, and the mission of my team is to design product experiences that amplify the world's ability to create and communicate. And here is that amazing team. So when I joined Adobe way back in 2004, yeah, 15 years ago, we uh, we're working on Creative Suite 2 at the time. And our product development process was about two years, which by today's standards is extremely long. Designers were considered decorators brought in at the end of the cycle to basically make things look pretty. Today, design is central to any company running an experience-led business. Design organizations are what I call full st stack, with superpowers across design operations operations, content strategy, user research, prototyping, and of course, UX design. And the work that we do has fundamentally changed. We now design for multiple surfaces, devices, and platforms with inputs such as touch, voice, and even body movement. We have an intelligent digital canvas that goes well beyond the screen, opening the door to imagine new, immersive, and augmented realities. And data plays a critical role in all of the design decisions that we make. So now, today, my team designs more than 50 products and services in collaboration with hundreds of cross-functional teams spread all around the world. It is a super complex matrix. And most of you in this room use several of our products to get your work done every day. And we use those very same products to design those products which is kind of meta, and also a great honor. So we use XD to design XD. We use XD to design Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign. All products shown on stage today have been designed using Adobe products by designers at Adobe. So one of the biggest challenges that we have is to design a unified experience across our entire product portfolio. 
And the complexity of this is overwhelming at first glance. So if we take a simple example, such as a button, there are nearly 1,100 variations of this component across the multiple surfaces, platforms, color themes, and frameworks we designed for. And this is just one tiny little example out of thousands. So the best way for any of us to address this type of complexity, this type of challenge, is, of course, with a design system. So at Adobe, our design system is called Spectrum. And Spectrum gives us all of the guidelines, tools, and shared experience language to work with. And building out Spectrum has definitely been a labor of love for my team and a multi-year journey. And we have learned a ton along the way. And everything that we've learned is helping us to make XD the best tool to help you build your own design system. Which is why I am super happy uh, and excited to share that Spectrum is now out in the wild and publicly available as a best practice guide for building your own design system and also as a great tool for our external developer community to use the very same building blocks that our internal teams use. So this is super amazing and awesome. So check it out. So we use XD to build and also uh, use Spectrum, which has been a force multiplier for design and engineering. Having access to all of the approved UI kits, fonts, and icons right within XD means we design faster, iterate more quickly, and share our prototypes to get feedback early and often with our stakeholders, uh, including Scott and, of course, Shantanu, too. And you can believe me, we get a ton of feedback. OK, so the XD team has been heads down, focusing on some amazing new enhancements for both design systems and collaboration. And to see just how amazing, here's Koi Vin to show you. Koi? Thanks, Jamie. That's my boss. OK, so Adobe XD combines all the design, prototyping, and sharing tools that you need into one seamless experience here on the desktop. And just like Jamie says, we use XD every day at Adobe. In fact, this is a project file from Photoshop on iPad, which Emily demoed for you a little while ago. We designed it all from scratch right here in XD, as you can see, using our Spectrum design system, loaded up, fired up, ready to go right here in my assets panel. So XD is really critical to the way we work at Adobe. OK, so the first version of XD came out Two years ago at Max, since then, we shipped over 150 new features, which is a ton of stuff to keep up with. So today, I just want to highlight a couple of the major areas where we've really leapt ahead. And the first is speed. Now, XD's always been super fast. Just look at the way I can zoom in and out super fast and performant. But we've also created some features that make it really easy for designers to work even faster than they ever have before. And the first feature is called components. Now, I've got a master component here. And if you've worked with symbols or smart objects, you'll know how this works right away. So this is a master component. And what I'm going to do is change the type here whoops, uh, from regular to bold. And then I'm also going to change the fill color to white. And just as you would expect, that's going to update right away on all the child instances of that component that I've got on all these other artboards. But components are even more powerful than that, because I can also uh, override specific properties on those child instances while keeping a link back to the master. So let me show you how we do that. I'm just going to drag here to get a new copy of this component. I'm going to turn on my guides and grids here. And what I'm going to do is override a lot of these layout properties in order to uh, turn this into more of a card layout. So I'm using XE's amazing responsive resize to do a lot of that layout work for me. And let's grab this icon here. And I'm going to override the size and position properties here in order to put it front and center. A few more finishing touches, like let's uh, override the background fill color here, change it from gray to blue. So, whoops. so just like that, I've got a new instance of this component. It's really different from the other instances. But like every instance, it's still linked back to the master. So if I want to make any changes, on the master, they're going to sync everywhere that I haven't yet overridden the property. So the rounded corners on this card, a bit too sharp for my taste. I actually want to change them globally. So on the master, let's just grab the corner here and pull on it. And as you can see, that updates in real time. Even with all those changes I made on the new instance, that corner is rounding just as you would expect. And also, while we're at it, let's change up the position for the scrubber, too. It should really be at 72%, just like the readout says. So I'm just going to grab it 
and move it to the right. And as I move it, note that it's also moving on all these other artboards in real time. Let me zoom out so you can see how across the whole project it's moving just like that. So just a taste of the kind of sophisticated control that you have over your design solution with components only in XD. No other tool gives you this kind of power. All right. So now let's talk about designing interactions and creating rich interactivity in XD, which is really straightforward with our prototyping features. But if I've got a feature, uh, a screen like this one with a ton of interactivity, like these switches here that need to get flipped on and off, you can see on the screen I've designed them to, to turn green, or different areas that need to open up and reveal different uh, cards or other UI elements, what I'm going to need to do is duplicate the same artboard again and again. And just so that I can simulate each piece of interactivity. And before too long, I've got a pretty cluttered workspace. And once I start to wire everything up for prototyping mode, things are going to get even more uh, crazy. Well, look at all those wires that I'll have to deal with. Well, in the new version of XD, we can actually just delete all these artboards because now I can do everything on one artboard thanks to a new feature we've got called states. Now, states is a way of stashing interactivity, so to speak, into components. So let me show you how this works on the switches. What I've done is I've turned the switches into components, and I've added a tap state to it. You can see here on the right side my property inspector, and that tap state is green, and it flips to the top. And I've used that same component on all these widgets here. And I've also designed some even more ambitious states. So this little weather widget up here, when the user rolls over it, what I've done is I've created a hover state that reveals a little popover menu with a full weather forecast. So Let's actually just take a look at this prototype in action so you can see the real power of state. So here's my desktop preview window. I can flip these switches on and off. And I can actually do that in any combination, which is actually something that was really difficult to do using the duplicate artboard method that I was using earlier. And here is that weather widget. If I roll over it, you get the full forecast. Also notice there's a little bit of motion there, and that's because states works with XD's auto-animate feature, which is our amazing visual prototyping method. It makes it really easy to add motion to anything, including states. So the transitions in and out of states are super elegant. States can also take on any size or dimension. So this tall, narrow state here, if I click on it, it just sweeps open with auto-animate, takes over that whole bottom of the screen. All this interactivity just with one artboard, thanks to states. Ah, thank you. Hey. So, these features are going to make any designer faster. But if you work on a team of designers, that's where XD really shines, because XD was built for teams of designers to collaborate. And a key way that we do that is with our support for design systems. So here's a design system we created for this project. This is just a way of organizing and capturing all of my colors, my um, uh, type, my, oops, sorry, I'm, uh, my type. Uh. Uh, my buttons, everything that I need to keep my whole design team working from a single source of truth. And in XD, our design systems are stored in the cloud. And that means that I can access them from work or from home. It also means that my whole team can get to this one single same design systems document. You can see here's a list of everybody who has access to the document. They can edit it at any time. And we can be sure we're not going to overwrite one another's work because as a cloud document, this design system comes with automatic versioning built right in. So you can see here, this menu shows a long list of the revisions that we made to this one document over time. If I want to save any of them, I can just click on this little bookmark. I'm just going to say max demo. And just like that, this is a new permanent milestone that I can revert back to at any time. All right, so those, thank you. Those are some of the basics of design systems. Now, let's actually start using those assets here in this project where I'm working this morning. What I want to do is get those assets here into my document. So under Share With You, here's the name of that document, Base Design System. Double click on it. And just like that, XC is going to grab all those assets and it's dropped them right here into the Assets panel. If I want to see just what's in that system, filter by the name. And that's, uh, I've got a shorter list. And now I can start using some of these elements right here on Canvas. So, the team has been working um, to design a bunch of widgets that I want to use. And th this first one here is a login widget. Uh, I don't know why I can't move this stuff. Sorry. My mouse is not working again this year. Oh, wait, there we go. Can I get a different mouse or switch, please? <sighs> Guys, this is just a ploy to, uh, uh, to solicit your sympathy. So while we're doing this, if you can just feel bad for me for a moment. Um, okay, so here we are in this uh, document. 
So what I'm going to do is move over here. I'm sorry, this trackpad is not working for me. Guys. <laughs> yeah. So um, what are you guys up to this morning? Uh. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Yes, mouse. OK. So actually, maybe we can uh, go back over here. Sorry, the machine is frozen or something. I can't seem to pan. It's not just the mouse. OK. Whoa. All right. OK, this is going to work. Look at that. Amazing mousing skills. <laughs> Amazing mousing skills. OK. All right, so uh, now I've got these assets from my design system, and I can actually just start using them. So it's really important to note, I'm not just using a copy of what's in that design system. I'm actually using the live assets that are linked to the real design system in the cloud. So if there are any changes, I can get notified here and update them right away. In fact, the team has been working off stage. It looks like uh, there have been some changes, I can tell, because of this little blue link here. And if I roll over it, I get a, a preview of how that's going to change. So I click on it, and that is going to update just like that. And I've got the latest and greatest from the design system. Uh, so you can see XE makes it really easy for me to share my work, my assets, my, my whole design system with my team. But we've gone even further and built an even more powerful feature on top of that same cloud foundation. And that is the ability to work in real time in the same document with my whole team. And we call this feature co-editing, and it's amazing. This is like Google Docs for design but with all the richness and robustness of a desktop app. And in fact, I've invited my whole team to start working here. You can see these artboards coming online now. Um, everybody's color coded so I can see who's working on what. This is so transformative for the design process because now we can see what everybody's working on at any one time. In fact, this is the way that the team at Adobe is working more and more every day. We love the transparency, the immediacy, and the richness and robustness and, and speed of a true desktop app. Nobody else can, can, can provide that. All right, so those are just a few of the enhancements we've made recently um, to the speed of design in XD, uh, uh, tools for collaborating on teams of designers, uh, and also just, uh, just some amazing enhancements overall. So if you haven't tried XD yet, go out, download it now. It's more powerful than ever. And if you have tried XD, you've got some amazing new features to start playing with. Download it and make something awesome today. Thanks very much for your forbearance. <laughs> Take care. So, uh, so thank you, Koi. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, of course, what you just saw are only a few of the innovations the XD team has introduced over the year. And there's just a lot of noise in the experience design space these days. I really admire the way the XD team has kept their heads down and focused on shipping great new features every month. And there's so much more to come. Another big development this year was the growth of the XD ecosystem, which has added hundreds of new plugins and integrations with partners like Microsoft, Jira, Slack, Zero Height, now your fingertips in the all new XD plugin manager, which you should also check out. And a quick shout out to hundreds of entrepreneurial partners that are now extending the XD ecosystem with really cool new plugins. That's also great to see. Um, XD is being adopted by big organizations these days, as big as Microsoft, WPP, and Infosys, as well as many new startups and design teams all around the world. And we're excited to partner with IBM to help companies build their own design systems. So look out for information on that as well. So uh, switching gears again, is it OK if I give you all a quick quiz? Anyone going to play along with this? Will you? All right, good. I'm going to say a line from a movie, and then you tell me which franchise it's from. Ready? I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. There's some smart people out there. I'll give you another clue here. Come with me if you want to live. More people. This has to get easier, of course, to get all of you on board. I'll be back. <laughs> Even uh, without the Australian accent, you got Austrian accent, you got that one. These are all lines from the Terminator movies. I mean, these movies really are ingrained in our culture. Uh, and it was exciting for us at Adobe that the filmmakers behind the newest installment, Terminator Dark Fate, which just opened, decided to lean heavily on Adobe tools to make this movie. So Premiere Pro 
was their primary editing tool. They used Photoshop and Illustrator to create templates. And then After Effects, Mixamo, and the newest addition to Adobe, the Substance Suite of 3D creation tools for the visual effects. But our video applications aren't just for those with blockbuster budgets. No matter what kind of project you're working on, Jason Levine is here to show you how Premiere Pro and Premiere Rush are going to save you time and help you make some pretty magical effects as well. Take it away, Jason. All right. Thank you, Scott. Hello. All right, my friends. Well, the video team has been extremely hard at work over the last year, really optimizing the workflows that you rely on every day. So the four features that I'm going to share with you really speak to this idea of making you more productive. And I'm also going to share with you an incredible new way to deploy your content to any screen and any screen size and any aspect ratio with the help of a little Adobe Sensei magic. So I'm going to start here on the HP ZBook, and I'm inside of Premiere Pro with some footage from Terminator Dark Fate. And we're going to talk about a feature called Freeform. And quite simply, Freeform puts all of your video front and center and allows you to organize and drag and storyboard any way that you like. You can pick up series of clips and drag them around. As you hover over them, you can see what's inside of those clips. You can set in and out points. If you have a hero shot, like this one of Arnold here, I can go ahead and make this extra large. I can take my clips and I can start organizing them diagonally, vertically, horizontally. However I want to organize, I can do it. I can even take a series of clips and move them off the freeform canvas because this is not a fixed view. In fact, when I scroll down, what you'll see is that this is in fact a continuous video artboard laying out all of your content, organized and storyboarded however you like, by scene, by time of day, by color grading status, just however you like it. So once I've got everything ready to go, directly from Freeform now, I can select my clips. I can simply build a new sequence right here, hit play, and just like that, my storyboards are now in the timeline, and I'm telling my story. Freeform is storyboarding freedom. <laughs> but what does that mean? I just made it up. I'm not entirely sure, but it's, I love it. Now, designers. You are all very, very familiar with masking. You heard Terry and Emily talking about masking earlier. Well, of course, in video, we mask as well. The only difference is that we mask over time, right? We mask multiple frames. In the case of a shot like this, this was captured on a Mavic Pro drone, 4K shot in Bali. Love this. We have these beautiful boats in the foreground, but the one right here has a logo that we don't want. We need to obscure that logo. So if I go into my effects controls, you can see that I created a mask here. And I'm simply, it's an opacity mask. I'm going to turn this on, which will flip it black. And I'm going to hit track forward. Now, the thing is, tracking in the previous version of Premiere for three seconds, 72 frames, would have taken about 40 to 60 seconds to process. But now, with the speed-enhanced masking and tracking engine, it happens in a fraction of the time. Whether you're working in 4K, yes, 6K, yes, 8K, yes. Now, of course, some of this speed could be attributed to the HPZ book. <laughs> Hashtag sponsored. <laughs> but regardless of whatever machine you're on, you will feel that speed performance difference. Now, let's cut to repurposing content. This is something that, regardless of whether you're a professional, whether you're just starting in video, you need to be aware of different screen sizes. If you're going to be sharing your content to social networks, you've got to think about widescreen, square, vertical, and everything in between. So here we have this lovely video of our skier shot in 16 by 9, but I've created these little boundaries because if I wanted to deliver this exact clip to a vertical uh, social network, as he moves through, you can see the problem is he's moving out of the center of the frame. So as the editor now, I've got to waste time coming in here and manually cropping and reframing and placing all that action in the center. Well, I'm very happy to tell you that today you no longer have to do that thanks to a new feature powered by Adobe Sensei called Auto Reframe. This incredible new game-changing feature will automatically use Adobe Sensei's power to scan and analyze your clip. And it's not just looking at faces, it's looking at motion, it's looking at region of interest. It knows what you want to show. Let's go ahead and choose something like a vertical 16.9. You can, of course, customize this to any aspect ratio that you desire. And we're going to click Create. Sensei does its analysis, and just like that, it creates the vertical version for me, which I can now upload to any of my favorite social networks. Yes! Ugh. Ugh. Yes! But, but, wait, wait. You know, this is, it is an AI engine after all. 
I mean, it might not capture everything that you need. You might want to make changes. Now, you're not going to hurt Sensei's feelings yet. <laughs> Am I right, Shantanu? <laughs> not yet. So if we go into the effects controls and I click on motion, first of all, you'll see that you have access to all of the keyframes that Sensei used to reframe your video. And as I scroll through this, scrub through it, you can actually see the bounding box showing you all of the motion that it did to keep that action in the center. I don't say game-changing too often. This is game-changing, time-saving, absolutely incredibly productive, and just awesome, and it's called Auto Reframe. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, of course, I'm not always on the desktop. Sometimes I just want to shoot and share. And the application that I use to shoot and share, of course, is Adobe Premiere Rush. Now, Premiere Rush was launched last year right here at Max. It is our cross-platform, cross-device editing app, and it makes it really easy to shoot right an app very, very simply. And then, of course, we give you all the things you need to augment and make your videos social ready. Things like motion graphics templates, hundreds, thousands of them, in fact, social call-out boxes, all available, and more to download via Adobe Stock. And then, of course, you have color presets, beautiful ways to augment your video with cinematic color, even manual controls. And if you look at these right here, very similar to Lightroom, yes! And then, of course, not to be forgotten, you have audio, right? You want to balance the audio. You want to remove background noise. You want to reduce echo. Sensei does it all. But the number one feature that all of our users requested was the need for speed, the ability to speed your clips up or slow them down. So here I have some beautiful butterflies captured by my friends at Via Films. They actually downloaded this clip off of Adobe Stock. And it's beautiful, but I want to make it more dramatic so that you can really see and feel the butterflies <laughs> fluttering by. So look at, look at how easy this is. I'm going to tap on speed. You have two simple handles, visual handles, at the top left and right. You can drag those handles to tell it where you want the speed change to begin. In this case, let's do the entire clip, and we'll take it from 100% down to 20% speed, just like that. You even have the ability to add a ramp to gradually increase or decrease that speed change over time. Let's go ahead and tap away. Let's go ahead and shrink this down. Let's go ahead and wind it to the beginning and play. And just like that, now we have beautiful, slow, dramatic, dreamy, dare I say, lovely butterflies flying by. He really digs butterflies. And now I'm ready to share. And of course, sharing is incredibly easy in Adobe Premiere Rush. You simply tap export. And Rush knows. It knows what you want. It knows the settings you want. High quality, best quality for all of my social networks. Yes, you have manual controls if you want to, but you don't need them. Sensei knows. And right from here now, you have the ability to deploy your content, to upload your content to all of your favorite social networks, including a new one that we're announcing an exclusive partnership with today, TikTok. And my friends, these are just some of the incredible innovations available in the video products right now. Thank you very much. I'll have what he's having. All right, thank you, Jason. We did preview Auto Reframe at IBC, this huge video convention in Amsterdam where it got just a ton of us. It's going to save video pros around the world millions of hours of tedious work and give them more time to be creative. So we're really excited about it. And today, as Jason said, we're also excited to announce a new partnership with TikTok. Premiere Rush is now the first app that allows you to share videos directly to TikTok, one of the fastest growing destinations for short form video. So we're excited about that as well. OK, I want to take a step back and talk just for a few minutes about the world we're living in and a new exciting initiative. So one of the biggest and most heavily covered issues today is content authenticity and trust. How do we discern whether an image or video is real and how it has been edited? In short, can we trust what we see? And there is no perfect solution for this issue. I mean, an Adobe can't solve the problem alone. Addressing it will require action from a broad set of technology companies and content publishers, like news sites and, of course, social networks. And, of course, all of us. I mean, the viewers of this content have a responsibility as well. But today, we have an exciting announcement to share. In combination with Twitter 
and the New York Times, we're announcing the Content Authenticity Initiative. Together, we're developing an industry-wide standard to allow creators to put their mark on their work and have that attribution accompany that piece of content across different platforms, posts, and stories. Here's a sample of how this might, a system might look in Photoshop. If you choose to opt in, the system can record what you do to a piece of work, what edits you make to an image, and what effects you apply. And then people who come across it on a website like Behance or another platform can easily view the information about who created it, you know, where the image or video came from, and how it was edited. And that way, you have the information as a viewer to judge the trustworthiness of the content, and content creators can be assured of getting credit for their work. Of course, we know that not everyone will share attribution data, but we believe that a lot of creators will be happy to provide this information, and over time, consumers will come to expect content to come with attribution. There is still a lot to figure out about the technical details and what will make the system most effective, but this is an issue that we are committed to addressing. We will be kicking off this initiative with a technical summit with relevant industry stakeholders in the coming months, and you can go to the URL above uh, to learn more and join the conversation. But our goals, our goals here are really pretty simple. We want to ensure that you get credit for your work. We want to help everyone evaluate the authenticity of the content that they see. It will be a long journey, but we are getting started now. I wanted to share that with you. Um, OK, so now we are going to jump into 3D and immersive media. We've seen uh, that more and more creative professionals are producing work using 3D tools. These tools are great for creating immersive environments, but they're also value for, valuable for traditional projects. I mean, many of you know that rendering a scene in a 3D tool is oftentimes cheaper and easier than assembling all of the elements for a traditional photo shoot or TV commercial. We're so convinced about the value of 3D today and in the future that we added the Substance team and suite of products to the Adobe family this year. We're going to see a quick video that shows the amazing things you can create in the Substance suite, and then I'll be joined by the leader of 3D and immersive development at Adobe and the founder of the Substance suite, Sebastian Degui. Let's roll the video. Welcome, Seb. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm continuously blown away by what's, also, you know, what's achievable with the Substance Suite. Maybe you can just, for a few minutes, describe to everyone, uh, what is Substance? What can people do with it? Sure. Uh, the Substance Tool Suite is all about bringing 3D objects to life with what we call uh, textures and materials. Details like the wrinkles around the character's eye or a woven texture of a shirt, uh, the moss growing between old cobblestones. Substance Painter lets you create these textures and paint these textures directly onto a 3D object. Uh, but you don't have to start from scratch. You can actually go to Substance Source and browse one of the thousands of 3D material that we have created uh, internally. And you can make, them your, uh, make them, uh, these materials your own material. You customize it in a very intuitive, very what you see is what you get way. You use sliders to adjust how much dirt there is on a road or uh, make a pattern more or less uh, random, or just whether a wood floor is shiny and new or old and scratch. So um, maybe you can just give us a sense of what kinds of teams and, uh, and companies are using Substance on a daily basis. Super proud of that. And uh, most of the AAA game developers today use the Substance Suite. 
And our tools were used on games like Fortnite, Forza, Spider-Man, and all of the most popular games you find out today. Uh, it's used as well in uh, visual effects and uh, on movies like Blade Runner 2049, Ad Astra, or Terminator Dark Fate. Um, lately, we've seen uh, the Substance tools actually picked up by uh, industrial designers um, uh, and companies like BMW, IKEA, Samsung, uh, Louis Vuitton, or even NASA. Uh, so they use Substance to visualize exactly what a chair or a phone um, or a rocket part would look like actually before building it. Uh, lately, also, we've seen architects uh, pick up the tool more and more. Uh, they can essentially build a house virtually and let their clients walk through it and uh, get the experience of living in it. So um, you're now the leader of the new 3D and immersive organization at Adobe. Maybe you could just share a little bit about what the team is focused on in this exciting new medium. Sure. Well, I, I really believe that we're in a golden age for 3D and immersive media, and we've solved some of the toughest technical issues. Um, what we need now is more great content. And uh, to get there, we need, I feel we need 3D tools to empower artists uh, to create these realistic 3D and immersive experiences. And this is exactly what we're doing with Substance, uh, but also with Aero, Dimension, and more to come. And this is why we're super excited to join Adobe, in fact. Um, uh, when you think about it, accessible and intuitive product design is in Adobe's DNA. Um, I feel that the very mission of that 3D immersive team at Adobe, the new team, um, is make 3D more accessible to many more artists. And that makes me and my team super excited, actually. Um, we believe the time is right for creative to jump into this new world of 3D immersive media. Well, we are really excited to have you, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome Thank you to again, team. Scott. Thank you. Sad. So, uh, so that is a little bit about Substance. Uh, I would encourage you all to check out the uh, Substance kind of setup in the 3D Village on the show floor. You can uh, try the tools hands-on, see some awesome new integrations and features, including one with HP that lets you scan real-world textures and materials right into Substance. It's pretty cool. It's a great tool for creating complex, realistic 3D materials and textures. But then the next step is to bring those creations fully to life in an immersive, three-dimensional environment like augmented reality. AR bridges the physical and digital worlds and truly has the potential to be bigger than the web. I mean, after all, we only experience the web when we go to it, but we'll experience AR all around us every single day. Imagine a future in which every sign on every street is personalized just for you, where you never get lost because way markers and turn directions pop up right in front of you wherever you go, or where you can find out just how many calories that croissant has just by pointing at it. Maybe not, but the prospects of living in an immersive world are, in fact, beyond imagination. And today, we're really excited to launch Adobe Aero, a key tool for bringing the world of augmented reality to life. Now, creation for AR is very new. So let's just take it step by step, like how this is actually going to work. So it all starts with acquiring an asset. These can be Photoshop files, Photoshop files you make or get from someone else. They can be 3D objects from stock that you customize with your own textures and materials using Substance, or you can create your own assets using a 3D modeling tool. Once you have your assets, you're going to want to design an immersive experience. And this involves assigning behaviors, triggers, and actions to every object in a scene using Arrow and the breakthrough technology that we call the Behavior Builder. Finally, you will want to distribute this immersive experience that you've designed, whether it be to a game, it could be via uh, a link to a friend, or to some augmented reality platform that may not even exist yet. But before we see Adobe Aero in action, here's a quick video about what life in augmented reality might be like. Let's roll the video. Play music. OK. There's been an update to your calendar. Show calendar.
There's an accident ahead. Should I show you an alternate route? Yes. Show bio. Save to libraries. Oh, hey, Jordan. Hey, Rory. Yeah. I saw this on my ride in. Might be cool. Climb half down. It seems that you're making lasagna. Should I turn on the oven? Yes, preheat oven to 400. Open preferences. <laughs> so uh, this just gives you a taste of the sort of immersive experiences that might change our everyday lives. Now I'm excited to welcome Chantel Benson, who will show you how to create AR experiences in the brand new Adobe era. Chantel. Thank you, Scott. Hello, Adobe Max. Great to be here. I am honored to be here to show you Adobe Aero. Aero is an app for designers to create and share augmented reality experiences that are interactive and immersive. Aero makes it possible for you to do this today using the content that you already create and have on your desktop right now. So instead of me talking about it, let me just show you. We're going to jump right in and create an experience together from scratch in Aero. Now, the first vital step in creating an AR is actually getting a scan of the world around you. And we do this so that Aero can have a good picture of where we can reliably place the scene. So it guides me through this, through visual cues, like you can see before me. And once I'm done, now I can start creating. So it's really easy to bring in my own content into Aero, and we're going to start by bringing in the star of this educational experience that we are going to create. This is a scarlet macaw. And I'm just going to continue to add elements here, like this infographic sign that it's just a flat image I created in Photoshop. And finally, I have a Photoshop file. It is a layered file, and that's all ready to go. OK, so you'll notice that as I put this scene together, uh, I'm just using normal everyday gestures to kind of rotate and scale, place these objects in place. Uh, it's the same type of gestures I use with my smart device. So if you have a smartphone or an iPad, you can use Arrow to put a scene together. Now, let's do something with this PSD back here. I brought this in, and when I put it to full scale, you'll notice that uh, Arrow knows that it has layers, and I can actually expand the space between the layers right here in Aero. And what's really exciting is that I'm creating for AR in AR, so I get a really wonderful understanding of what, what my viewer is actually going to look at when they view the experience. And I'm just going to dial back those layers a little bit. I've got full control here to kind of adjust things as I go and really play with it. All right, I'm going to scale that up. And then just a few more adjustments to these assets. I'm going to put them in the scene here. And great. OK, now everything's in place. I did that really quickly with just a few uh, movements there. And now I've got this compelling, immersive scene of the rainforest. But let's take this to the next level. Let's actually add some interactivity. Now, what do I mean by that? Arrow lets you be the director. You can set the when and the how your viewer is going to engage with the scene content. So right now, this, this scarlet macaw is just going to sit there and look pretty. But I want him to actually fly around that rainforest scene. So I can do that by adding behaviors. And just as Scott was mentioning, you know, I want the viewer to be able to touch that bird and have something happen, have the action happen. So we've got a lot of 
options to choose from here. I'm going to choose animate, and I can set that loop to be in infinite. Now, I can play back just what that action and trigger sequence is going to do by just tapping this in the, uh, the action panel. And I know that that's just going to have the bird's wings flap. That's not enough for me. I actually want to see this bird flying around the scene. And to do that, I'm going to actually add a few more behaviors here. And I can start to layer them on top of each other so that they start to play in parallel. I can get really rich with this. Now, I'm going to add the anime action and then do something really special with it. Instead of just playing an animation, I'm now going to become the choreographer of this scene. And when I, the countdown goes, I can actually draw that path of motion through the scene, and it's going to be beautiful. All right, I get that visual feedback of where that path is going to take the bird. Now let's see what that looks like when it comes all together. So. Over in preview mode, this is a direct simulation of how a viewer of this experience is going to engage with this on their own device. They see this beautiful scene. They understand that they can actually walk into it, get that nice parallax effect, and then they can touch the bird and have it fly through the scene. I think it's ready to share, don't you? All right. So Arrow makes it very easy to share and publish directly from the app. You can either take a video from right here, you can share a link that can be sent to somebody and have them view it in Arrow on their own device, or you can even share an exported file that can be put into another application. So if you want this experience about the scarlet macaw to be in an app about the ecology of the rainforest, you can do that with Arrow. OK, so let's just recap, because a lot just happened. I just created a whole new AR experience with my own content, including my own Photoshop files. I added interactive moments to draw in and engage the viewer of the experience. And I can publish the whole thing directly from the Arrow app. So Arrow is for you as creatives to tell your own unique interactive stories that are go going to engage and inspire on a whole new level. And now the entire world is your canvas. Thank you. So thank you, Chantel. So Adobe Arrow is available today for free in the iOS App Store. So jump in, check it out. And uh, a lot of amazing things are already being created. OK, so we have shared a lot of news with you today. And I want to quickly, quickly recap it before we go any further. In addition to Adobe Arrow, today we're shipping the revolutionary Photoshop on iPad. We are continuing the rollout of Adobe Fresco, the world's best drawing and painting app, with new additions for Microsoft Windows and Surface devices and Wacom Mobile Studios. We've previewed Illustrator on the iPad coming next year. And we showed you the new Creative Cloud desktop application and the newly reimagined Creative Cloud libraries. These make collaboration with Creative Cloud and even third-party tools, as you saw today, like Microsoft Office, so much easier. More to come there. And in addition, we've made literally hundreds of improvements across every application in Creative Cloud. Your favorite apps like Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign are now even better. Among those improvements is also a new version of Adobe Acrobat that allows you to edit PDFs on the fly on iOS and Android devices. So we're excited to have you dig in and discover what's new in your favorite application. There is just a ton of amazing stuff in there. And that sums up what we're launching today. Throughout the morning, you have seen a lot of Adobe Sensei magic. And here to talk more about Sensei and the future of creativity and to share a sneak peek at a new product we are really, really excited about is one of the driving forces behind that Adobe magic, our chief technology officer, Abe Parasis. Welcome, Abe. It's great to be in LA. What a show. I think Nicole and team are absolutely world class at putting this together. A round of applause for Nicole and Joe and team. So it's been a jam packed morning, and I hope you're all excited about all the innovations we are bringing out to you today. But of course, we are not done yet. So let's talk about AI. You have seen hundreds of examples 
of our work with Adobe Sensei and how that's powering all the product innovations on stage today. It's foundational to everything we are doing. And when we started this journey with AI, we shared a deep belief that AI done right can in fact amplify human creativity, not replace it. We have been really hard at work executing on this vision with Adobe Sensei. Now, since I started with a focus on delivering AI-powered magic across all the tools that each of you use every day. But at the same time, we were also building a truly breakthrough Sensei platform, one that has become a true foundation of innovation for a lot of what we are delivering today and what will be coming tomorrow. And today, we are at an exciting point where the Sensei platform is evolving with a very deep focus on creative intelligence domains. Domains like imaging, design, video, documents, and immersive media. And this deep specialization on the creative process and the creative fabric is what makes Sensei extremely unique in the industry. With this platform in place, we are ready to push the limits even further. So let's start with imaging. Without a doubt, this is one of our most advanced AI domains with decades of experience with products like Photoshop and Lightroom. Whether it's content-aware fill, face-aware liquify, many, many masking and advanced selection tools that you saw today are all increasingly powered by imaging AI. And what's exciting is now we are starting to train Sensei to not just understand pixels and colors, but truly understand concepts of objects and compositions. Armed with this higher level understanding, you can now find that one perfect asset in hundreds of millions, thanks to AI. And as you can see here, we are taking visual search to an entirely new level with a creative canvas that not only allows you to search for similar content, similar colors, but it's actually starting to understand objects and concepts and relationships. And we are extending these advanced search and object level concepts to all our core editing tools. Whether it's Sensei-powered search in Lightroom or the object selection tools you saw this morning in Photoshop. And of course, even as we deliver these, we are pushing way further with reimagining creative workflows and imaging workflows by rethinking around AI-generated images or GANs. Now in video, the challenge for AI is the added dimension of time. Understanding not just the concept of static images, but the relationships between moving images all in real time. And as you just saw on stage, content-aware fill for video or auto-reframe in Premiere Pro are just a couple of great examples of how Sensei can dramatically speed up your productivity in editing tasks. Now, of course, while we have figured out how to speed up, we haven't figured out how to bottle up that energy in any AI model of Jason's energy and slow him down a little bit. That is probably way beyond AI. But we are building on our rich investment in imaging AI and reimagining it for video. New Sensei models will make it possible to change the style of a single video frame and transfer it to the entire video. Here we are showing you painting or stylization that propagates to an entire frame where you as an artist just paint one frame and Sensei will take care of the rest. Think about that. That is truly groundbreaking. It's going to save months, if not years, of editing time, but also enabling completely new forms of storytelling that wasn't possible before. This really is what we mean by amplifying human creativity. Video AI is a big focus for our research and Sensei teams, and we are thrilled to push forward in this area. Lastly, immersive media is the next frontier. It's an incredible new medium for creative storytelling where the world around you becomes your canvas. And today, we are excited to put Aero 1.0 in your one, version 1 in your hands so we can begin this immersive journey. And as the physical and digital worlds blend, real-time AI is going to play a very pivotal role in this new medium. Now, with Aero, you can already animate 3D objects just by using a phone or tablet. But by adding Sensei Intelligence, 
we are generating a whole new class of smart objects and characters that are entirely driven by AI. And simply by moving your device, you can control the life performance of a digital character all as it interacts in physical world around you. Think about that. And of course, we had to start with the most difficult one, but also the cutest one, a little puppy. And as we think about this, this is going to enable every one of you to create incredible new immersive experiences and do animations that were only possible with the help of massive 3D and CGI teams before. It's early days, but we are truly excited about disruptive potential of AI-driven immersive media. Now, of course, in addition to imaging, video, immersive, we are continuing to push in other areas with Sensei, like design, as you saw with Illustrator, documents and PDF, and voice. But today, we are on the cusp of beginning an even more exciting chapter with Sensei. Imagining Sensei-first apps that can only be built with machine learning and AI. And I'm truly excited to be able to share with you a breakthrough Sensei-powered app that we have been working on for a while. And what better place to start with the one app that all of us use every single day, the camera on your smartphone. The smartphone camera has fundamentally changed how hundreds of millions of people create and share their stories. And while the industry has pushed really aggressively the limits of hardware, we think the software magic has been limited. That's all about to change today. We believe the world is ready for the next chapter where it's not just about more megapixels or more sensors, but how you can uniquely express your personality and creativity through the lens on your smartphone. So we asked ourselves a couple of simple but profound questions. What if we could bring the magic of Photoshop directly to your camera viewfinder? And what if we could bring the power of sensei intelligence to the palm of your hand, seamlessly amplifying creativity directly at the moment of capture? Well, that's exactly what we've done. I'm super excited to announce Photoshop Camera, a Sensei-powered app that reimagines what's possible with smartphone photography. As you know, a lot of hard engineering work went into bringing Photoshop to the iPad. But of course, we didn't stop there. We went way further and decided to bring the power of Photoshop directly to the camera lens on your phone. With Photoshop camera, you can capture, edit, and share stunning photos, natural or creative. It's a new AI-powered camera that can instantly recognize objects and compositions to make smart recommendations in real time. And of course, because it's Photoshop camera, it's got to bring breathtaking Photoshop magic directly at the point of capture. This has been never been done before. Lastly, we wanted to make sure that it unlocks the power of creative community, all of you, to experiment and build amazing and eye-popping lenses for this new camera. In other words, we are building the world's first software programmable camera. And of course, it's so easy and simple to use. Anyone can use it. To give you a taste of what this camera can do, I'm thrilled to welcome Veronica Belmont to the stage. Veronica. Thanks, Abeg. Hello. Photoshop camera brings all the magic of Photoshop out into the real world and right into the palm of your hands on your mobile device. Now, at its core, it's a really great camera app. It has all the features and effects that you would expect from any modern day photography app. The real addition, the real advantage, is the addition of your friend and mine, Adobe Sensei. Let's take a look at how it works. So right away, Sensei is figuring out that I am trying to take a selfie. Not an all an awkward thing to do in front of 15,000 people. So let's see, I'm gonna take a picture here. Beautiful, okay, let's open that up from the camera roll. And right away, Sensei is going to recommend some lenses that work great for this type of photography. So I'm gonna click on the lenses and hop into portrait. And right, oh, such a beautiful shot. And right away, we can see all that great depth of field that it's adding. I can scroll through these different options here and it really makes a nice looking photo.
But the lighting here on the stage is really good. We're not seeing the full impact. So let me open up another photo that I took from my camera roll. This one of the observatory. Now, right away, you see that huge difference? That's Sensei applying all that technology that we have baked into apps like Photoshop and Lightroom. It's adding auto-toning. It's fixing the brightness and contrast, basically making me look like a halfway decent photographer. And you can really see the difference if I hold down my thumb on the screen. You see that change right there. And now I can go in and make some more manual changes, too, by using the sliders up here on the top, add some highlights or clarity if I want, or I can hop into Photoshop Express to make some additional changes. But let's get a little more artistic and open up analog. And you can just see, these are pretty great ways of just adding some creativity to your everyday photos. And now that's just a look at how Sensei makes this an incredibly powerful app for taking and editing photos in real time. But we're not just calling this Photoshop camera for nothing. Let's see some of that Photoshop magic at work. I'm going to open up this photo of my team on the Spark team at work. And we're going to jump into, oh, I think they might be here. We're going to jump into Spectrum. And right away, Sensei is figuring out what the subject of this photo is. It's making changes to the foreground and background. It's adding all these great effects. And we can take it one more step by jumping into pop art. And right away, I can manipulate this image just by grabbing the background and moving it around on the screen. I can scroll through these different options. This element can be enlarged here and changed. And I can really spend hours just playing around with these different options. What? Perfect. All right, but let's test this out in real time with a landscape image. I'm going to switch over to my forward-facing camera. And there we go. And we're going to test it out on the big screen in real time and see how it works. Can I get my background of the LA skyline? Any moment now. They're taking the picture in real time, potentially. All right, that's OK. Oh, oh, hello, it's behind me. Why didn't you guys tell me that? All right, you were right there all along. OK, so we're going to snap a photo. Perfect, and I'm going to open it up from my camera roll. And notice how this is a beautiful daytime photo. We're going to change that real fast by using Night Shift, just like that. So not only has Sensei changed the background, but notice how great the masking on these buildings is. And it's changing the whole color temperature of the photo, too. It's making it really feel like an immersive environment. Now, remember that scaling I did earlier? Let's make that super epic. Isn't that amazing? Let's, let's make it a little more fantastical. I'm going to jump into comic skies. And just like that, you can see this incredible motion that we've added into this. You can scroll through and, and kind of put yourself into these immersive, fantastical worlds. And when I'm happy with my final project, I can share it out on social to apps like Instagram, I can share it out on Spark, I can save it to my camera roll and share it other ways. And that's just a real fast look at how lenses really make this a fun and engaging piece of content that you can share anywhere. All right, now, here in the audience today, we have you, the creative community, and you're probably wondering how you can get involved, and I want to show you the Lens Library. This is a collection of curated content from all different sorts of artists, designers, animators, and this list is going to be updated all of the time. So for things like seasons or special events, like Max, for example. And you can jump in and learn more about each artist. But I'm here to tell you today that you, too, can create your very own lenses for Photoshop Camera. I'm going to show you how. So we saw a fantastic demo earlier today of Photoshop on the iPad. So I'm going to switch over to that and jump into a lens that I've been working on called Dreamcatcher. Now, right away, you see that this is a Photoshop document. It's a PSD. All of my layers are being represented over on the left-hand side, so I can go in and really manipulate them as I see fit. I'm going to hide this moon here. Actually, you just go hide it. We don't need to delete it. I'm going to open up another project that I've been working on, another file, rather, my Max Moon. And just like that, I've made some quick and easy changes. Not too crazy. I'm going to save that out and head back over to my phone and we're going to test out that lens in real time. So I'm just going to open it from my files here. PS camera lenses. There's my product. OK. And we're going to go back to LA, which will probably show up behind me once again. There we go. And just like that, in real time, my lens working. And not only did I just open this up, but also it's treating this moon like an actual light source. How awesome is that? I'm just going to take a snapshot there. Yeah, right? Now, just to recap, 
With Sensei, we've made this inc an incredibly powerful app that does all the heavy lifting for you. Lenses using Photoshop magic are fun, beautiful, and really easy to use. And the community of creators out there can create their very own lenses so we can see the world through your eyes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Veronica. Great demo. And that's a pretty cool video. Anne and team, as always, did a perfect job capturing the perfect vibe for this new app. As someone who's passionate about photography, it's been really fun for me to see creations from some of our early adopters. As you see these, it's clear that capture is truly the new creative. Now, we have also started to work with some artists and influencers to see how they can uniquely express themselves through this camera. One such artist is Billie Eilish, who we have collaborated with to create some limited edition lenses inspired by her music. And the best thing is she'll be on stage tomorrow talking to Anne. Now, we want to begin this journey with Photoshop Camera with all of you. So starting today, you can go to photoshopcamera.com to sign up for a limited preview of this app but also sign up to submit your ideas for creating new lenses. The general availability will be in early 2020. At Adobe, we absolutely thrive in being at the intersection of deep science and the art of storytelling. And Photoshop Camera is a major moment for all of us as we, in our journey to truly democratize creativity for all. It's time to give smartphone cameras some personality. And we are looking forward to all the amazing moments you capture with this app as you get your hands on it. Thanks, and have a great Max. Back to you, Scott. So uh, thank you, Abe. We are, we are so excited about Photoshop camera. In fact, we're playing with it backstage. But it's going to be a great addition to, the Photoshop, to Photoshop Express and part of our continuing efforts to put some of the power of Photoshop in everyone's hands. OK, so we are about to wrap up two things. Number one, I just want to say a thank you to the teams behind these products. I mean, these are some of the most passionate people who come to work every day and are often up at night just thinking about what you do and how to make it better. They have such passion and commitment to the segments and just take a, take a quick step up. Members of the Adobe team in the house, just take a quick step up, and I just want to thank you for all the work you're doing to make this possible. <laughs> These teams. Um, and finally, before we go, just a few reminders. So join us for tomorrow morning's keynote which will feature conversations with musicians Billie Eilish, the Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl will be here, and director M. Night Shyamalan will be here as well. So that's going to be amazing. The hilarious John Mullaney will be on hand for everyone's favorite part of Max, Sneaks, where you get a preview of upcoming innovations from deep within the labs. They are awesome, inspiring, and funny. And we look forward to seeing all of you at the Max Bash tomorrow night. It will be one not to miss. For all of you joining us online, we'll be live all week long on Adobe Live on Behance. Thank you all for coming, and enjoy the rest of Max. Thanks.